So welcome, welcome back after the break, after the lunch. Um, I'm very pleased to have uh, a session now, a panel now about uh, heritage and art. I think we will have a very interesting uh, panel this afternoon and uh, I'm especially glad that I have the opportunity and the great pleasure to announce uh, only Ukrainian speakers which have have we <laughs> except for you but you told me that you have roots so uh, <laughs> Um, some, of some of you have, you told, have told us that there are, are two, two, two uh, little, little Ukrainian voices. voices. I agree this. with this. And, and uh, uh, thus, thus I'm, I'm glad to have, to have them here. here. Uh, uh, our, our first speaker will be online. Can we have uh, Konstantin Akinsha? I will start to introduce him nevertheless. Um, Konstantin Akinja is a Kiev-born uh, art historian, curator, and expert on art expropriated during uh, on on art expropriated during the Second World War. It's uh, he's dealing with uh, art loots, looting during the Second World War. His public publications include "Beautiful Loot: The Soviet Plunder of Europe's Art Treasure." Uh, published with Grigory Koslov and Sylvia Hochfiel. He has been a, f uh, a fellow at the Max Weber Colleague for Kultur und Sozialwissenschaften uh, at Erfurt. Erfurt, and he is now in London. He is member of the International Association of Art Critics of the UK. And uh, since uh, the uh, uh, beginning of the war on o Ukraine, he has been publishing uh, a lot of uh, articles in new news newspapers about the role of culture and art in the face of war. Uh, some of them in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung. And so uh, we uh, found out uh, Mr. Akinja. And it would be great to have him here now on the screen. Do we have a chance? Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Do you hear us? Do you hear us? It's not so easy with the technique, nevertheless. nevertheless. Yeah, now. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yeah, but you cannot see me. No, we no, do we not do see, not you, see yet. you yet. But, but... You know, it's not necessary, necessary to see me. If, uh, can we... Maybe we, we, we will start uh, without your picture and then the... No, you don't need my picture, you need my presentation. We start, we start with presenter. Okay. We try to set up the technical issues. Okay. Okay, great. So um, we will do it that way. So may I come to the second speaker? This would be Varvara Kaidan Shavrova uh, from London. She's a visual artist, curator, educator, and researcher. She lives between uh, London, Dublin, and Berlin. Uh, she, she studied in Moscow and at uh, the university, Goldsmiths University of London. She um, actually, uh, she has been awarded Arts and Humanity Research Council Studentship by London Art and Humanities Partnership and uh, to conduct, co conduct her practice-based PhD at the Royal College of Art in London. She has exhibited internationally, including at the Venice Biennale of Architecture, and uh, her work is re represented by Patrick Heide Contemporary Art in London. 
So you will talk to us about the art of self-termination, how the creative communities in Ukraine and the Baltic states can resist Russia's invasion. The floor is yours. Thank you. And with the, with the presentation? It will come on, so I can start with the introduction. Um, Self-determination is the key word leading us to understanding how the artists from the Baltic states and Ukraine indeed can resist Putin's aggression. Self-determination means freedom of speech, oh yeah, here we go, um, and of artistic expression, which is precisely what Putin's aggression has been set to attack. It would be good if it clicked. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, say again. We will get there in the end. Yeah, I will carry on and then uh, I suppose it will start working. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, it's, not, it's not going through the images. Yeah. Sorry. Mm. I think I'm the first person showing images and it is challenging, but because of that. <laughs> that's art history. That's art history yesterday. That is the direction, okay, thank you. So uh, yesterday we had lots of um, incredible presentations and today, and we, we had no images. So I chose to bombard you with nearly 40 images of Ukrainian and Baltic artists' works because I believe that culture is essential and it's particularly essential in the context of war. We will all go, but the artifacts and the artworks will remain. Art cannot exist in confinement. Art cannot flourish without censorship. Uh, sorry, with censorship, subjugation, and oppression. Artists set themselves to break all boundaries, and that is why the future of Ukrainian artists, filmmakers, poets, painters, musicians, is, in my view, a bright future. Today, Ukrainian art is about reassessment of the outdated Big Brother ideology, which infantilizes Ukrainian language and makes fun of Ukrainian culture, known to have denied not only its originality and validity, but also denying its very existence. The other role of art in Ukraine today is to offer resistance to violence of the war, to the death and destruction brought into every Ukrainian person's home by Russia's invasion. And this resistance is currently focused on documentation of war crimes, through the process of witnessing and chronicling the war within the artistic domain in visual arts, music, literature, and theater. Uh, this self-determined approach to carry on was established at the very onset of this war. And amidst the commonly felt disbelief, chaos, devastation, and sadness, Ukrainian artists are managing to continue making their voices heard, even with the minimal means that come with the territory of war. Who can afford a studio space? when there are artillery strikes and power outages. Yet, by this perseverance, it is already clear that the Ukrainian artist cause will be victorious and that their role in documenting and later on reflecting deeply on what happened is what will be left for the humanity to witness and for years to come. So, reassessment, um, of the big brother and the erasure of memory is one of those themes that have been important for Ukrainian artists for many years. And of course to the artists from the Baltic states. I hope so, let's see. Is it better? Mm -hmm. 
You see, when we start talking about images or showing images, there are technical issues. But I think that it, it's good enough so you are able to see um, most of the content. So I will show quickly the images that were generated as part of the Big Brother campaign, and then also the images that um, are veering on the border of documentation and art, i.e. photography. We all remember the Baltic Way, a human chain spanning the Baltic states uh, from Vilnius to Riga to Tallinn on 23rd of August, 89. We all remember the Ukrainian wave that showed the solidarity of Ukrainian people and their desire for freedom and their self-determination to be independent from the Soviet republics. The parallel of those images are incredible. We remember the toppling of the statues. And we remember the final declaration and the ceasing of the Soviet Union to exist. All of those images informed artists and were part of the artistic language in the 90s and in the noughties. And so there was this period before the war when dismantling the monolith and preserving the history was an important debate and an important cause that the Ukrainian artists have taken. I will focus just on a couple of artists from this period because of course there are many, many more, but we're limited in time. So I will just going to give you a feel of the narrative and of the preoccupations that the artists have been working to up until the war. Um, the artist Nikita Kadan, who is very active on the Ukrainian art scene today, has been working for many years on the theme of the dismantling of the monolith. Born in Kiev in, Ukraine, in, in, Kiev in 1982 and graduating from the National Academy of Fine Art, Nikita Kadan works with painting, graphics, and installation, often in interdisciplinary collaborations with historians, architects, and human rights activists. He's a member of the artist group REP, Revolutionary Experimental Space, and founding member of Hudrada Artist Committee, a curatorial and activist collective. Kadan lives in Kiev. His works were presented at the Ukrainian pavilion of the 56 Biennale in Venice in 2015 and again last year. And so the work that we're looking at now, the Red Mountains, uh, created in concrete and metal, is a very interesting series. It's a reconstruction of the pedestals from monuments by Ivan Kavaleridze, Artyom Monument in Bakhmut, Artyom Monument in Svetahirsk, and Taras Shevchenko Monument in Paltava. And what is very interesting about these sculptures is that, of course, there is no, mon no more monument left, so the protagonists have been removed. Yet, the plinth itself becomes the monument, and the debate here is between the artist and the history. When the monument takes, uh, gets taken down, is the plinth still remaining? Is the imprint of totalitarian regime therefore still standing on the Ukrainian soil? And I find this is a very poignant um, address, a very poignant question. Victory White Shelf, um, another sculptural piece, is a modified reconstruction of the model of monument to three revolutions, 1825, 1905, and 1917, by Vasily Yermilov, or Vasily Yermilov. And there are an, an, a number of elements within the sculptural installation, including the melted cups you will see sitting on a small shelf that were found in the ruins of house destroyed by artillery strikes in the city of Lysychansk. The other works here, the flag and tiger leap, 2018. Very important in my view, uh, particularly in the context of the war today. Tiger's leap is one of Walter Benjamin's most well-known concepts applied to the work of Nikita Kadan. The reading of, of tiger leap comes to mind. A tiger's leap into the past rejects the idea of time as linear and sequential in favor of a creative use of past example that breaks with the temporal continuum. The Tiger's Leap allows people to seize on the past as a source of difference and thus to draw attention to new possibilities for change in the present. 
Kadan makes a series of tiger leaps by appropriating historical events, objects, and designs, and reinterpreting them with a contemporary urgency. Uh, Bjorn Geldof, the curator of the exhibition. Nikita Kadan talks about the importance of being faithful to history. And in conversations with Larissa Babich, who asks, who is the addressee of your works? Kadan responds, narrated history, history under glass. And when you say faithful history, to be faithful to history, what history are you talking about? History is recounting what has happened and examining the manner of recounting. Um, the other artist whose work I would like to mention here is Mikola Ridney. And it is interesting because his work is on display in a Ukrainian exhibition that opens today. I will give you the details in the end of my presentation. So, uh, Mikola Ridney was born in Kharkiv, and he lives and works in Kiev. Ridney works across media, ranging from early collective actions in public space to the amalgam of site-specific installations and sculpture, photography, and moving image, which constitute the current focus on his practice. In recent films, he experiments with non linear montage, collage of documentary and fiction. His way of reflection, social, of reflecting social and political reality draws on the contrast between fragility and resilience of individual stories and collective histories. Um, this quotation, when we don't know what to do, let's do whatever we can. I came across uh, during my research trip in Lithuania, because the research trip to Ukraine couldn't happen. Um, I came across this quotation in a poster project created by, in encounters by Lithuanian artists in solidarity with the Ukrainian artists and Ukrainian people. The full quote says, when we don't know what to do, let's do whatever we can. Let's support those who are fighting, not only for their freedom, but for ours as well. And um, briefly covering the general sentiment about solidarity and support, that artists across Eastern Europe expressed to Ukrainian artists um, was really relevant and very obvious at the exhibition, uh, the group exhibition curated by the um, three women curators in the National Gallery of Lithuania in Vilnius. Again, there is so much I can talk about, but we'll have to skip very briefly through the uh, curatorial idea. With the beginning of Russia's war in Ukraine, the past has returned in Eastern Europe, changing from something distant into a present-day disaster for millions of people. The invasion that started in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea, Luhansk, and Donetsk has often dismissed, what was often dismissed by the international community, but it has now grown into a situation that is affecting the whole world. This war has hit Eastern Europe most alarmingly, reviving many silences, unhealed wounds, and unprocessed memories of the totalitarian past. And so the works by these artists included in difficult past connecting worlds made clear that the shadows of the past are also in need of urgent processing in the present. The works shown by the Lithuanian, Latvian, Estonian, Ukrainian, and Russian artists in exile remind us of these shadows, the legacy of which is still felt and experienced in the former Soviet bloc countries, i.e. Soviet invasion in the war in Afghanistan, the works responding to gra uh, gratuitous racism, xenophobia, the persecution of ethnic minorities, to anti-Semitism and the silencing of the individual. This work was particularly poignant because it's made by um, an artistic duo in response to memories of Holodomor that were relayed to them by their grandmother. And the pieces are very modest. They're just made by printing vegetables and fruits that were left on the plate um, and creating printed images. Um, and a series of them presented us in a very modest way, but as a, a marker of the disaster of the Holodomor that um, remains in the memory, but needs to be somehow re-examined and brought back uh, to the attention. 
To the chronicles of war, we must see, we must imagine. So as I mentioned, um, the artists in Ukraine continue, but one of the main roles that they play now is the roles of documentation and the chronicle. There are groups of artists who meet regularly, who manage to continue making films, writing plays, even staging uh, productions. Um, there are, of course, artists who are still managing to work in their studios. And what is apparent is the sense of unity and the sense of purpose that those artists have. They're optimistic because they're free to say what they want to say and they're able to show the world the atrocities and also to, to, to make the world understand what does it mean to remain a creative voice in the situation of the war. In reference um, to the four black and white photographs that were taken in Auschwitz concentration camp by a Zona commander and smuggled out for the world to finally see the horrors, the mass murders, the hell that descended onto earth. In his seminal book, Images in Spite of All, the French historian of the Holocaust, George D.D. Huberman, examines the phenomenon of imagination when to try and understand what ultimately cannot be understood. To begin to imagine the terror that the inmates experienced in the extermination camps of the Holocaust and to create a valid testimony that will give a voice to the voiceless. To do this, it is important to use one's imagination as a tool of human empathy, as a tool of compelling, uh, of comprehending the comprehensible, imagining the unimaginable. And so the keeping of the diary or the chronicle has become a very important language that Ukrainian artists have adopted. Um, a number of artists come to mind, but particularly Vlada Ralko, who has created the Kyiv Diaries and the Lviv Diaries. Uh, Vlada Ralko created a chronicle of the events on the Maidan as they slid into war. As graphic narrative, the text of Kyiv diary, uh, of, of diary consists of 358 drawings that the artist created from 2013 until 2015. The diary contains many allusions to Shevchenko's protagonists, who along with the characters from national mythology or folklore, Cossack Mamai, a cloth doll, etc., seem to have become active participants of recent events, or rather were made newly relevant by them. This is the extract from Jessica Sigovic's uh, Superfluous Women, Art, Feminism and Revolution in the 21st Century Ukraine. Another artist that has been working in the genre of documentation and chronicle is Evgenia Belarusitz. She created um, a diary that was shown at the Venice Biennale this year, and currently the exhibition of her Kiev um, chronicle, the image of which we're looking at now, Diaries from Kiev, is being exhibited in Reichstag. So these artists, they do document the impossible. They do face the terrible. They do chronicle this for history. And then, of course, there is music um, and many other art forms that I haven't spoken about. There is a term ethnopatriotism uh, by Walter Benjamin, the desire to preserve unique traditions within Ukrainian arts and culture, the drive to expel the aggressor from all fronts of Ukrainian life, including from the cultural life, and finally, the purpose in creating art for the future, the need to rebuild new Ukrainian culture that will rise from the ruins of the war. You probably have seen, or you all must have seen the Stefania by Kalush, the Eurovision winner. And there are other artists who obviously work within the same themes, creating images with their music videos of warrior figures, especially warrior mother hero. This is the message that was um, part of the Kalush video. And other artists um, like Alina Pash make very impassioned images. Oh, something happened. There we go. 
So you can see the images are also including the direct appeal. Oops. This is the end of the music video. Unfortunately, I won't be able to play it for you, but um, again, it's very powerful imagery that deals with the disappeared uh, children, the children that died as part of the war, but also the Ukrainian children that have been taken to Russia and they're still, um, have not been found. So to conclude, I will say that the shaping and framing of history is the politicization of memory. And where this is hostile to the truth and to self-determination, there is always a role for artists to create work that can act as a shield that consolidates and protects cultural identity and its independent development. When I was thinking about the theme of the conference, politics of memory as a weapon, I thought that maybe it's more appropriate to say politics of memory as a shield, the shield that the artist can create. There is little difference between grim reality for those artists caught up in the devastation and disaster of Putin's war today and the many artists persecuted during the Holocaust, or indeed during all gruesome wars instigated by genocidal regimes throughout history. Yet their work survives, their work prevailed long after they were gone. Today, in the world of mass media and immediate global communication, I will argue that the efficacy of the artist's works, the far-reaching emotional language of art and culture, can play a critical role in expressing the Ukrainian people's desire for a just peace that fully recognizes their unique and cultural identity. Tragically, the effects of this senseless and unjust war will be felt for decades to come, and there the role of the artist will continue by engaging the imagination that Didi Huberman talks about as art must do, and also to process memories, both individual and collective, to express poetic commentaries that reveal and inform truths that robustly resist misinformation and the cynical attempts at erasure and subversion that always accompany war of aggression. Today, Ukrainian artists find themselves at a crisis and at the front line of the crisis that is too raw and immediate to create meaningful artwork about. It's too soon. But there is a strong sense that this is a temporary situation. And when the war is over, most people who were involved in the war will be long forgotten. Yet the art, and the culture will stay as testimony, as memory, as a proof of the victory of humanity over evil, of light over darkness. Because of the just cause that every Ukrainian person is pursuing by resisting the aggression, it is also clear that the art will indeed flourish and it will prevail, making the future of Ukrainian art possibly the most interesting to watch in the European as well as the global context. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very impressive uh, presentation on the role of art, on the positive role of art as a testimony, as a shield. Maybe we should hear uh, after that the paper by Alina Mosolevska because she will talk about the weaponizing of art uh, on the Russian part of the war. Yes. Please take it. Uh, please let me introduce Alina. She is um, an associate professor at the Institute of Philology at Petro Mohila Black Sea State University in Mykolaiv, Ukraine. She has a PhD in linguistics with a major in Romance languages from Taras Shevchenko National University in Kiev, Ukraine. Her research interests include media st studies, border studies, critical discourse anal analysis, and text linguistics. And one of her latest uh, publications is about construction of borders and walls in contemporary Ukrainian literature in uh, the um, journal Altre Modernita from uh, two years ago. So the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for having me here. Thank you for this kind presentation. Um, I just need my PowerPoint. One minute. 
Um, it's interesting, now we will also talk about art, but um, mostly about popular culture. And uh, um, I would like to present uh, some insights, it's work in progress, but maybe it will be interesting also to reflect how different form of arts interact and how uh, these uh, different forms tell the story and make the sense of the war. Um, one minute. Um, the data that I have uh, and the data that I work with is from social media. Uh, it's different form of uh, art. I work mostly with cartoons uh, and memes and meme-like uh, artworks, artifacts that are circulated in social media such as uh, Vkontakte, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Telegram and Viber. Um, it's true to say that Technological conditions do not only determine how wars are conducted, but also how they are communicated. And we see that the, uh, since the beginning of uh, uh, full-scale invasion, uh, our social media and also our old media are flooded with images or with visual content. It can be uh, amateur drone footings from the front line. It can be professional visual analytics. It can be static or moving images. Uh, some content attempts to document the war. Uh, other content, tr content tries to make sense of the war. Uh, but uh, we see that we live in times of interactive wars, when the line between documenting, interpreting, and entertaining is very uh, weak because the documenting content is always mixed with artistic interpretations or with funny images of cats. So it's a um, very rich uh, area where different type of content, uh, content interact. And if we talk about this war uh, that was called uh, first TikTok war or first social media war, it is true that there is some innovative uh, elements that make it more visible in social media. For example, the innovation, innovative technological means that Zelensky uses to communicate with uh, uh, domestic audience, but also with international audience. But also the presence of um, different influencers and artists who produce the content. After the beginning of full-scale invasion, uh, a lot of social media groups were created to uh, recirculate um, and narrate the war with the help of popular culture. Um, we will now see some examples from social media, um, from Ukrainian uh, groups, and also for, uh, I will try to make a comparison how um, visual popular culture is used in um, pro-Russian environment in Vkontakte. So why it is important? Um, uh, when we talk about popular culture, it's not about the informal communication between user, users. Now the elements are of popular culture a part of information strategy uh, on the state level. For example, you see now uh, one of the first uh, uh, Twitter messages from official Ukrainian uh, Twitter account that is called Ukraine. It appeared the first day of invasion and uh, uh, it says that it's not a meme, it's our reality. And actually it reflects the feeling of many Ukrainians who woke up with the explosions at 5 a.m. Uh, the allusions uh, and the comparison with the first days of invasion of Ukraine uh, at the beginning, uh, at the uh, uh, Second World War, uh, were resonating in the memories, in collective memory uh, of Ukrainians. But uh, also what will be interesting to see how memes and cartoons and visuals are used uh, in, on the official level uh, in the, uh, for example, one minute. <laughs> Where is it? On the state level, for example, if we talk about official uh, Twitter accounts of uh, Russian uh, state institutions, S here you see some examples from official pages of um, embassies uh, of Russia in Spain and in Italy. 
And the official, uh, the screenshot from the official page of uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia. And also we see the history is mobilized, but also some narratives that are targeted on the um, uh, larger aud audience, not domestic audience. For example, here, where is it? Ah, here. No, 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 I'm just trying to use this red small light to show about what image I'm talking, with the bear. Um, you see here a pure manipulation uh, and the attempt to present uh, Russia as a victim, as a protective mother bear who is attacked by Ukraine. Or, uh, oh, sorry, I need to come back here. On the top, uh, the mother bear meets uh, little bears, the new family. Uh, it's the image that reflects uh, the official vision of Russia of referendums in uh, um, Kherson region and in um, LNR, DNR and in the Parisian region. You see that um, the elements of popular culture, the cartoons, are used on the state level to pro propagate the vision uh, of the war and to reshape the understanding, the our understanding, uh, understanding of the war. Um, if we talk about a um, larger context and uh, if we talk about the media communication um, in online groups, in Kontakt and Facebook, uh, we can see that uh, it goes even further uh, with the help of the images of pre-digested messages, um, there are some attempts to reshape the understanding of not only war, but larger historical context. But also, it's also the way to make reconciliation with the reality to get, you to, uh, get used to it. For example, if we see how images are used to um, make sense of the war in Ukrainian uh, social media, we will see that no we won't see <laughs> one minute yeah here uh, so we will see that um, um, the main message maybe at the beginning of the war uh, in ukrainian media was uh, the attempt to understand and to accept the reality uh, to explain it in some familiar words. Uh, and to do this, uh, the historical narrative of uh, World War II was mobilized. Uh, in the attempt to explain the atrocities of Russian army in uh, Ukraine, uh, they were compared, compared with the soldiers, uh, German soldiers of, uh, um, of the World War II. And the bombings that they were made um, by uh, Russian army also were explained uh, and some allusions were made at the um, uh, attacks on Ukrainian cities during World War II. I don't know. <laughs> Here, okay. Um, but when the war develops, develops um, other, um, other narratives appear. And um, the World War II, it's not the only historical reference that's used in Ukrainian social media, because if we um, take the uh, larger context, we see that uh, Russia is aggressor not only for Ukraine, but also for Syria, Georgia, Chechnya. And um, in Ukrainian media, a lot of images are recirculated to um, try to, uh, in the attempt to understand uh, these big narratives of invasions and aggressions and to see the real face of the enemy. <laughs> there, okay. And um, the real face in the enemy has a really symbolic image in social media. Um, uh, Putin is called Putler. And there are a lot of symbolic representations of this, um, um, of Putin as Hitler. We see here that um, uh, these personalities, because of 
their similarities. Um, uh, they are approached and actually fused. And we have one symbolic, like collective representation of the evil in Ukrainian social media. Uh, but um, interestingly enough, <laughs> yeah. um, the image of Putin is also fused with the image of Stalin. So we have this intermingling narrative of um, uh, the World War II that brought a lot of loss and grief to Ukrainian people and also the period of um, uh, Soviet period that also brought a lot of loss uh, and um, totalitarian act uh, for Ukrainian people. Um, And that's why uh, these two historical narratives come together. Um, in the attempt to explain the cruelty of the uh, war, uh, we see that these historical narratives are mobilized in order to uh, show and bring into surface the illogic and cruel facts of uh, aggression. Also, symbolically, um, there are allusion, allusions on the symbols that are used during the World War II and the symbols that are used by Russian army, like Z, Z um, uh, in a visual discourse. Mm. Another element that is very important for Ukrainian social media, uh, it's uh, the attempt to mobilize a population using deeper is historical narrative that is proper for, uh, for Ukrainians and Ukrainian identity. Um, there are a lot of images of Cossacks um, and uh, the bravery of uh, Ukrainian army is directly connected to the image, symbolical image of uh, Cossack. We will find a lot of examples um, when uh, state officials or simple warriors are compared with uh, um, this symbolical representation of resistance, resilience, and bravery. And finally, um, one more thing. And finally, actually, the fight between um, Russia and Ukraine is presented as a fight between uh, these two narratives totalitarian um, uh, Soviet and uh, national Ukrainian. For example, on the image on the uh, right, you see the position between um, Ukrainian Cossacks and uh, uh, Russian army that uses at the same time uh, Soviet flag and Russian flag. Uh, another element that is very important um, when we use historical allusions and historical narratives, uh, okay, I will go very, very quickly. Um, it's the, the attempt to counter in Russian propaganda. Um, here, we, uh, there are attempts to dismount main narratives. Um, um, for example, um, on the right you see uh, the attempt to compare the image of the Russia and the, the real history that was um, presented uh, on the bottom. As I don't have a lot of time, we will try to make very quick overview of uh, visuals that are used in Vkontakte uh, in pro-Kremlin groups and pro-Russian groups. Uh, there are several main messages that are there. The first message, we won't let you to write or rewrite our history. And the... Um, uh, narrative of victory in the Great Patriotic War and the narrative of victory in special military operation, they are combined and um, the story uh, is written in continuity between the Soviet past and the victory of the Soviet army and the present and the victory in special military operation. The image, images that I used claim that if the Soviet army won th that war, it will win the special military operation too. And this continuity is also um, uh, supported by the um, images that combine historical narratives, 
the images of the past and the images of the present. You see that there is no rupture between the Soviet past and the present that is presented in these pictures. Um, another element that is very uh, repeated and supported by some verbal messages that we cannot lose. Um, here, Russia is presented as victim, uh, as country that is every hundred years attacked by somebody, but nevertheless, uh, it always wins. Again, it's very connected to the myth of great patriotic war and the uh, uh, victory of uh, Soviet Union in this war. Um, there are also the same narrative of constructing the other, of reshaping the image of the enemy, um, and the exploitation of the image uh, of the personality of Hitler, but um, this personality is directly connect, connected directly to Ukrainians. And uh, it goes deeper because, for example, here you see some jokes, for example, typical car in Ukraine, typical bike in Ukraine, or typical, typical toy in Ukraine. Uh, the fascism is used like a trigger uh, to mark everything that is bad. And everything is, uh, that is bad for them is everything that is somehow connected to Ukraine. Um, and um, recently, um, these images appeared, um, and the Ukrainian president, as you saw in uh, Ukra Ukrainian media, now Ukrainian president in Russian media, is also incarnated and combined with the elements of uh, historical personality of Hitler. Uh, Sorry, we switched something. But not only, uh, because we talked yesterday and today about the collective West. The collective West is now also presented as something connected with the history of Nazism and fascism. And um, for example, the Chancellor Olaf Scholz is presented as somebody who talks with Hitler, or um, the sanctions are presented as something uh, as like genocide uh, uh, towards Ukraine, uh, to towards Russians. Um, also, um, uh, the mobilization is based strongly on symbols of Soviet um, you know, past, like uh, Russian flag, um, Soviet flag, not Russian flag, and also the, the images of uh, Soviet soldier. Um, I would like to finish with these two pictures. Uh, uh, that mobilize some narratives, uh, some key narratives, like the, the demonization of the other and the, the, um, the role of the West. But we will compare them with these two pictures, if they appear. Ah, no, we, we jumped with this. You see, actually, the same images are used, but they transfer uh, they actually convey the, contra the really the opposite meaning. Um, that's why it's very interesting to analyze social media because sometimes with the same tools we can actually convey opposite messages. Thank you for your attention and I will be glad to have discussion later. <laughs> Thank you for another great presentation and the parallelization. I think it's uh, amazing to see that. <laughs> it's it's astonishing and, and on the other hand, uh, very impressive to see how media does work and how the same can mean the opposite. Thank you very much. Um, and I think, again, we should uh, take our next speaker here from the room because uh, uh, she will be talking about a film on Second World War from the Ukrainian and from the Russian perspective. So I think this will connect to, to the former presentation better than uh, Konstantin Akinja's presentation, with we, which we will have at the end. So let me introduce to you um, <laughs> Olga Radchenko. She is um, associate a professor at the National Bogdan Chaimitsky University in uh, Cherkasy, Ukraine. 
She uh, lately had a virtual fellowship at the IBM Institute for the Wissenschaft von Menschen in the project documenting Ukraine. She uh, has done a lot of research and had many fellowships in, in uh, for example, at the Institute for the Con Contemporary History in Munich. And uh, I'd like to mention one of her latest uh, presentations, uh, publications, sorry, Getrennte jüdische Familien, beiderseits der deutsch-sowjetischen Grenze, 1939 <laughs> bis 1941. <laughs> Im Band in the volume Familientrennungen im Nationalsozialistischen Krieg. So, uh, the floor is yours, uh, Olga. I'm glad to have you here. Thank you very much for the kind presentation. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this very interesting and important, important conference. So, let me to introduce my topic, my team uh, today. Uh, of course, my English is not so well as of my uh, colleagues because I am, my first uh, <coughs> foreign language is German, but I'll try to uh, read my <coughs> text in English for you today. So. <coughs> Just a moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, tradition, traditionally, in the post socialist countries of the former Soviet Union, the cinema industry has been considered one of the most important tools of propaganda. The so called Great Patriotic War, 1941 till 1945, is one of the subjects that were preferred in the Soviet times. One can remember many feature films that were distinguished by good quality since they were shot by former participants of the war or by their uh, relatives. There were also many actors who were direct war participants or witnesses. Among the filmmakers and actors are such prominent Ukrainians as Alexander Dovshenko, Sergei Bondarchuk, Grigory Shukhrai, Leonid Bikov, Larisa Shepetko, and Lyudmila Gurchenka should be mentioned. Despite the political and military censorship that strove for the Soviet news of the war, most films presented the events of the war more or less truthfully. Great attention was paid to humanistic approaches, although such difficult questions as captivity, collaboration, or mass deportations were mostly left out. Several Soviet films received prestigious international awards. Mikhail Kalatozov's Screens Are Flying, The Golden Branch in Cannes, 1958, Ivan's Childhood by Andrei Tarkovsky, The Golden Lion in Venice, 1962, The Rise of Larissa Shepitka, The Golden Bear in Berlin, 1978. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You want to go back? Yeah. Maybe I will take this. It, it may be easier to tell <laughs> you. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it so, such a way. Uh, uh, that was uh, an image about the film Ivan's Childhood. Please, the next one. Yes, Twilight's uh, um, Are Quiet Here was one of the favorite films of Soviet audience, uh, directed by Stanislav Rostotsky, 1972. Please, the next one. So, in the first decade after the collapse of the Soviet Union, as new political groups struggled for power, the post-Soviet cinema industry, like culture at large, remained, remained in a state of disrepair. Few productions included the Ukrainian film Cherry Nights, <coughs> directed by Arkady Mikulski in 1992, it was a dramatic love story of a girl and an KVD officer in Western Ukraine at the end of, of the war. The girl was a messenger for the Ukrainian insurgent army, Ukrainian <coughs> abbreviation UPA, which, as is well known, fought against the Red Army and the Soviet Security Service and KVD. With this film, Ukrainian filmmakers began to catch up 
on those aspects of war history that had been either kept secret or labeled as hostile in Soviet public discourse for decades. This trend continued with renewed vigor under President Viktor Yushchenko. In 2005, Valery, Valery Shaliga released his film The Distant Shot about Ukrainian Red Army soldiers and UPA fighters who were taken uh, <clears throat> prisoners by the Germans and met each other there. At first, they treated each other with hostility, but later realized that their common goal was a free Ukraine. Please, the next one. Under President Petru Poroshenko, three feature films were made that dealt with the war. The first was called The One Who Walked Through Fire by Lyalienko, 2012. The prototype for the main character of the film was a famous fighter pilot, hero of the Soviet Union, Ivan Datsenko, who first fell into German captivity, later in a Soviet penal camp gulag, and fled from there to Canada, where he was to become the chieftain of an Indian tribe. Please, the next one. The second film by the Tar Ukrainian director Achtem Tesebleyev from 1913 was entitled The Return, Tatar Haidarma. He depicted Stalin's 1944 deportations of Crimean Tatars as if they were being watched by two times hero of the Soviet Union, fighter pilot Ahmed Khan Sultan. About 700 contemporary witnesses who took part in mass scenes gave the film a special authenticity. Four years later, 1917, the film The Red was produced by Zazu Buadze, which focused on a Soviet fighter pilot, but now with a Russian surname Gurov, and the Yupa fighter nicknamed Chervoni, again in Gulag. Despite the unjust sentence, Gurov fanatically believed in Joseph Stalin, but Chervoni wanted to continue fighting against Stalin and organized an uprising in, in the camp. In addition, two feature films were made on the history of the Holocaust, including one of the mass murders of Jews on September 29th, 29th and 30th, 1941, in the Babin Ravine near Kiev. The film <coughs> was directed by Mikola Zazeev Rudenko in 2002. And please, the next one, Vladiko Andri, directed by Oles Yanchuk, 2008, dedicated to Archbishop Andriy Sheptitsky, who saved Jews in Lviv and its surroundings. In total, there are seven feature films in Ukraine that depict very different dramatic events of the war. Please, the next one. <clears throat> so, Quantit quantitatively speaking, the number of feature films in Ukraine, in Ukraine is incomparable with that in the Russian Federation, especially after Vladimir Medinsky took office as a Minister of Culture in 1912. Before we talk a little more about so-called masterpieces of the Russian film industry since 2012, we have to mention some Russian films films about the war made in the first decade of the 20th century. It's about the film in August 1944, filmed by Mikhail Ptashuk, based on the novel Moment of Truth by former military scout Vladimir Bogomolov, where German spies and diversants were portrayed as experienced and dangerous enemies. The next year, the film The Star appeared which told about a small reconnaissance raid in the enemy's rear. In 2002, the film A Cuckoo went as screens, which being based on a story about a young Finnish girl, a Finnish soldier, and a Soviet officer attempted to downplay the Finnish-Soviet military struggle. Please, the next one. In 2004, the film The Hours by Dmitry Mishiev was shot with very good cast, including the, promo the prominent Ukrainian actor Bogdan Stupka. Three prisoners of war from the Red Army escaped during the march and hide in the house of a vil uh, village elder. 
The film touched on such important historical areas as the treatment of politically and racially intolerable elements, prison solidarity and outbreaks of anti-Semitism, as well as collaboration in the countryside. At that time, the, the film received several awards at the Moscow Film Fest Festival. Bogdan Stupka was nominated for the European Film Academy Award. According to many Russian film historians, this film is considered the best even today. In 2008, the film We Are From The Future was released, which saw a new trend to transport our contemporaries, especially young people, to the time of the war. Ten years later, in 2018, in the film A Borderline, a businessman from Petersburg was transferred to Leningrad during the Nazi blockade. This fantastic story was premiered with the presence of Vladimir Putin and war veterans and members of the military patriotic search groups. A Belarusian-Russian co-production The Breast Fortress by Alexander Kot in 2008 addressed the heroic resistance of the Soviet border guards. The film with a modest budget still enjoys acclaim from viewers. Please, the next one. <clears throat> a completely different stage of Russian film production began when Medinsky, who had been fascinated by the war history since childhood, took office. In 2011, he published his pro program work, War, Myths of the USSR, 1939-1945, where he described his concepts of the positive and black myths. The black myths are those works that, quotation, profane our memory of the war, end of quotation. Since Medinsky rhetoric repeated Soviet propagandistic phrases, he was heavily criticized by Russian historians, which actually did not prevent him from putting his plans into action. For this purpose, the Russian Military History Society was founded in 2013, which supervisory board includes many governmental officials, including Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. This society is also very interested in film production because films with good myths are not only constantly aired on state-controlled television and in all Russian cinemas, but are also supposed to be shown in so-called military patriotic children's camps. There are now 15 such camps in the Russian Federation and three more on the occupied Ukrainian peninsula of Crim. Medinsky facilitated subsidies and state programs for so-called socially important topics, including history. Respectively, large-scale film production was launched. In the following year, 2013, the film Stalingrad was shot with a budget of $30 million. The funds were provided by Russian state institution Fond Kino Film Foundation and the Russian Military History Society mentioned above, as well as by the second largest Russian bank, VTB. On the other hand, the making of the film 28 Panfil of Men initially started through fundraising, but later Russian and Kazakh state funds were engaged. The main thing was that it met Medinsky's demand for a positive myth. Please, the next one. After that, a tank became the main character in a number of films. These were The White Tiger, uh, you can see the year of production and number of views on YouTube. Uh, the next one, uh, uh, the invincible, uh, invincible uh, of Deutsch wie unbesiegbare. Uh, the third one, the tank. Uh, the fourth one, the uh, T uh, thirty four. All of these films have the same flaws, especially in relation to historical truths. This applies to both military technology and warfare. The protagonists lack any character traits. 
Their functions consist in operating the tanks or in the search for love affairs. Please, the next one. In the film The Tank, which depicts as much of the first T-34s from Kharkov to Moscow in 1940, in the genre of a comedy, real events are fal falsified to extent that Marshal Georgi Zhukov, who is now canonized in the Russian Federation as the greatest commander, gave permission to the tank's inventor Mikhail Koshkin for this march, which was not the case. The writers of the screenplay did everything they could to stuff the film with absurdities. For example, there were so-called white guards and German motorcycle drivers in the deep Soviet rear, even before the invasion to the Soviet Union. A good Soviet girl managed to liquidate one of the drivers with a shovel and so on. The next highly subsidized uh, film, T-34, uh, was also produced as a fun quest where a main characters naturally stayed alive. The film did well and the viewers were satisfied. In 2020, two more soap operas came to the screen, which constantly revolved around love affairs on the background of tank battles, namely Tank Man and Strong Armor. According to viewer ratings, the films were of extremely pure quality. Former officers of the Soviet and even Russian armed forces were particularly outraged. It's no wonder, wonder that Russian film historians claim in unison that contemporary films lack real experiences of war and then the war is not shown as a tragedy at all. The story is mythologized. Instead of the slogan, never again, we can hear, we can repeat. The war events presented have nothing in common with history. They are not based on documents or testimonies. The fantastic film discourse and kitsch now dominate. The cynism has gone so far that the new movies can be shown on television for the first time on the New Year's Eve. The war is served as a kind of starter with a glass of sparkling wine. Another thing that catches the eye with films about tanks is their extreme timeliness, as tanks are widely used in today's war against Ukraine. In this sense, all recent films, especially about tanks, act as programming works for young generation. Please, the next one. It's not by chance that, despite its comedy genre, Comrade Stalin, Voroshilov, and Zhukov parade in Red Square as wise uh, leaders of the Soviet uh, nation. Next to them is loyal youth. Uh, <coughs> The target group of this propagandistic mise-en-scene, which is reminiscent of Soviet posters, are today's young men who in just a few years will bring Russian tanks to Ukraine with the logo Z. The victorious tonality of all these Russian films is broken by the fact that the Russian tanks are successfully fought by the Ukrainian army, with more than 3,000 already destroyed or captured. The dramatic results of Russian film policy and propaganda cannot, can not only be seen in the destruction in Ukraine. Soldiers and officers of the Russian Federation who take part in the war all too often behave like they are in a bad film or in computer game. They obviously enjoy endlessly destroying houses with tank gangs, guns. Many members of Russian army have neither sympathy nor pity for Ukrainians. Their knowledge of the country and its people is primitive and incorrect. When young Russian soldiers ask their commanders how to identify Ukrainian Nazis, they reply, you'll recognize them, they are dressed in black uniforms. Quotation end. Please, the next one. 
Not only Russian politician, politicians and statesmen are responsible for this, but also renowned uh, directors, such as the, as the brothers Nikita Mikhalkov and Andron Konchalovsky. Mikhalkov is a trusted advisor to Medinsky, and his experience is evident in the film T-34, where he emerged um, as one of the producers. His own films about the war on the eve, 2010 and Citadel, 2011, entered the list of the worst Russian films. Russian film historians rightly dismissed them as the products of a sick imagination and the tremendous humiliation of Russia. However, Nikita Mikhalkov has one trump card. He often and loudly declares his love for Putin and enjoys his care. Please, the next one. So, it's an image from the film um, on the eve. Uh, the director, screenwriter, and main actor Nikita Mikhalkov leads his army and civilians armed with sticks on the water as a general to attack the German citadel. Allusion to Jesus Christus is obvious. Deus Ex Machina guarantees a happy ending, and the victorious general soon drives to Berlin on a tank. Please, the next one. The film Paradise by Konchalowski, 2017, probably wanted to depict the impossibility of making paradise on Earth, but we quickly became a projection screen for the director's self-admiration and vulgar morality. In this way, these films of the brothers became a kind of benchmarks for the younger generation of Russian filmmakers. A few more words about lists of recommended war films compiled in Ukraine and in the Russian Federation. The Ukrainian Institute of National Memory offers a, a wide international range of films, including Soviet and Ukrainian-Russian uh, co-productions. In contrast, the Russian list only deals with the latest Russian films. At the same time, Results of a survey conducted last year by Mosfilm showed that the, while the older generation prefers old Soviet films about the war, many youngsters like the latest productions about tanks. Please, the next one. I would like to quote the Russian film historian Khochlov. Inherent in the recent feature of films are scandal and epatage as a marketing strategy for product promotion in mass media, infantilization when teenagers, immature youth become protagonists, fantastical circumstances, postmodernist games with Soviet myths, a dramatic juxtaposition of good and evil, typical for fantasy, and, as a consequence, a complete neglect of historical texture. The target audience of such film projects is youth, whose historical memory is formed through this fantastic discourse. Amazingly, Russian propaganda initially succeeded in getting both the younger generation and the older one enthusiastic about the war against Ukraine. The first target group uh, sees, it, sees it as an opportunity to earn some money and to satisfy their thirst for adventure. But the second still lives with a deep trauma of the Nazi occupation, which, uh, which was activated by Putin's propaganda, mostly with fake news on TV and mass rituals on Victory Day on May the 9th. The 9th. The real aims of the Russian military attack on Ukraine are criminal in nature, is still incomprehensible to many citizens of Russian Federation. I thank you for your attention. And on the last images, you can see some literature sources for my text, if you are inter interested in it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this interesting comparison of film productions which leads us again to the power of images. 
So, and now we are already late, but we have started later and we have technical problems. I hope they are overcome now and we can have Konstantin Akinsha from London here. How does it look like? Okay. So maybe once again, because you might not remember Konstantin Akinsha, is an art historian and uh, critic and curator in, um, in London. Uh, he has published about uh, art looting during the Second World War. Sound. He doesn't hear sound. Uh, it, it's for you, so I, <laughs> I can continue. And uh, he, he is publishing, uh, publishing now continu uh, uh, continually on... <laughs> on art looting during the war on Ukraine. So that's what we will be talk about or hear about. Oh, great. Hello, Mr. Kincher. I'm sorry for the technical problems and I would ask you to start your presentation. I have, have presented, presented you, you here, here, to, here the to the audience. audience. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to, I need my presentation, one second. Uh, uh, may I ask you, please, if it's uh, wait, wait a second, okay? Don't go in. Yeah, I have. Uh, I'm sorry. Do you have a copy of my presentation, which I sent to you? Excuse me. Technique tells me that they didn't get your presentation. Maybe you you can make okay, Mr. Kinch a, a, a moderator and he can present uh, it uh, himself. Have, yeah, I have to restart uh, Zoom. You have to wait for one second because I sent the presentation to you. Okay, I'm trying to restart it. Uh, so I'm leaving meeting and I will appear in a sec. Sorry, not so easy anyway after three years of Corona. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Yes, so, we yes. got it, I think. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Lights. Yeah, great. Thank you. So please start. So, let's start. Uh, my presentation will be dedicated to a few issues. And uh, first of all, the conference is dedicated to the politics of memory as a weapon. I want to talk about uh, politics of uh, weaponization of history and weaponization of culture, which led to the results which we'll, we'll address later. Uh, participants of this conference already showed posters with such a slogan, but in this case, it's uh, an exceptional case. On the wall, you see a poster 
which is a pastiche of a um, poster of the beginning of the Second World War created by Kukrinixi, but with a uh, changed slogan. Here it's written, we will not permit to rewrite our history. Uh, this photograph was made in the uh, office in the city of uh, Melitopol, where Russian occupiers were given to the population of the city or tried to enforce population of the city to receive Russian passports. Uh, by itself, the idea that uh, the history cannot be rewritten is quite peculiar. In contemporary Russia, history is taken as a holy script. Official uh, version of it cannot be put under any question, uh, which uh, effectively making any historical research impossible. This process started before the war. Already a few years ago, uh, Russians made efforts to create special commissions which had to observe uh, correctness of history, which uh, can uh, and to create the version of history which cannot be questioned. Uh, all of this is very peculiar, and of course, uh, we cannot um, uh, to pay some attention to the culture war, which started uh, with the beginning of the Russian aggression. Uh, probably all of you learn and read about. Uh, a uh, new wave of destruction of monuments in Ukraine, which um, uh, this time received new name. A few years ago, destruction of communist monuments was called Lenin Fall. This new wave was called Pushkin Fall. Uh, we have many talks in Ukraine about decolonization. Of course, this process now is very emotional. And I can say that it's not deprived of the elements of zealotry. Sometimes it's leading to quite peculiar situations like mass renaming of streets in Ukraine created such uh, paradoxical cases as renaming of Dostoevsky Street in Kyiv into Andy Warhol Street or renaming of uh, Lyotov Stoy Street in Hust into Boris Johnson Street. But the question is, what kind of Pushkin Ukrainians are fighting with? Obviously, this Pushkin has nothing in common with the historical Pushkin. And it's not very easy even to establish nowadays what is the historical Pushkin. Through the history of the 20th century, the meaning of Pushkin was changing quite Re, um, uh, frequently. On the left side of the picture, you see a cartoon from the 1929, during the last period of the Cultural Revolution, when Pushkin was treated as a singer of monarchy and uh, utterly reactionary poet. Uh, on the left side is a play uh, made um, by uh, in Palich, a place of production of lacquer miniatures. In 1937, when uh, Stalin organized stunning celebration of uh, uh, 100 uh, uh, anniversary of the Pushkin death. On this plate, you can see a beautiful combination of Pushkin and Stalin portraits and uh, many images of Red Army soldiers who are researching Pushkin ever or painting his paintings. So uh, in the uh, Stalinist Soviet Union, Pushkin became a kind of a party comrade. Poet Bizemensky even wrote a poem uh, claiming that Pushkin is a true member of the League of Young Communists and he is standing among gods on the tribune of the party congress. Uh, creation of this uh, Stalinist model of culture was very peculiar, and it requires a long time to discuss it. But in any case, new canon of Russian literature was created, which included Pushkin, Tolstoy, 
uh, Mayakovsky, the poet of the revolution, and Maxim Gorky. Uh, so monuments to Pushkin uh, became a new marker of uh, Russian territorial or Soviet territorial gate, or marker of presence of the Soviet Union in the different parts of the world. Uh, it's an interesting situation. We don't know any equivalence of this in the classical colonial powers. And again, Soviet colonialism is quite specific and needs further investigation and research. It's not corresponding to um, uh, standards of colonialism of the 19th century. But Pushkin became a part of this marking. And uh, on the left side, uh, many of you, I hope, um, uh, recognize this monument. The monument of Pushkin erected in Weimar in 1949. So GDR was established in uh, October of 1949, and already in the beginning of November, you had your Pushkin and your first Pushkin Strasse. Uh, the same story happened in Hungary, where monument to Pushkin in Budapest uh, was erected like literally one month after full communist takeover of the country. Uh, however, this um, uh, marking by Pushkin tradition did not stop after the death of Stalin. We had different wave of it, waves of it coming uh, back. Uh, in 1970s, uh, Pushkin monument was erected in uh, Uzbekistan, now, during the same year, the Pushkin monument was erected in far away Cuba. And uh, by beginning of uh, 2000s, uh, Russians returned to the old practice. They started to stick these monuments in all possible places, uh, this time in Europe. A new monument was put in Budapest in 2017. Uh, now there are, I think, six Pushkin monuments in Budapest in different forms, and uh, in Cyprus and in Greece and uh, all over the place. It's very interesting story, as I already know, uh, mentioned. British colonialists were not putting monuments to Shakespeare uh, in um, uh, all around India or even in Ireland. Uh, so, this Pushkin is not a Pushkin. This Pushkin is a symbol of Russian presence and symbol of this complex of historical and cultural stereotypes, which are included in the model, uh, which recently received the qualification and name of the Russian world. Uh, Russian world is very peculiar conception. It's very interesting that it's a period not today, it's already forming for good 10 years. Uh, methodologically, it's uh, based on very funny foundation because, uh, uh, let's say, ground for the definition of Russian civilization, uh, Putin ideologists are finding in three sources. In um, uh, Spengler, in Toynbee, uh, and finally in Huntington. Uh, despite the negative approach to Russian civilization of th all three mentioned uh, uh, characters, the very idea that they introduce such definition is very pleasing Russian. So Russia is not a separate country. It's a separate civilization, which is not fully connected to European civilization or uh, historically opposing it and uh, not fully connected to Asian civilization. However, he has uh, more bridges with it because uh, nowadays the uh, uh, conception of um, Eurasianism, which was uh, produced in the um, um, first part of the 20th century by Russian philosopher, emigre philosophers, is used and abused and again changed for the needs of uh, contemporary Russian ideology. 
all of this led uh, to uh, extremely important role of cultural heritage for support of this civilizational model. Uh, after occupation uh, of Crimea, after annexion of Crimea, one of the symbolical step of the Russian government was organization in Moscow in the Tretikov Gallery of colossal exhibition of Ivana Ivazovsky, uh, an artist who was active in Crimea in uh, 19th century and probably the most important marine artist in the history of Russian art. Ivazovsky, by nationality, was Armenian. So uh, this exhibition was needed because it corresponded to the slogan of the day, because Crimea was returning to the native harbor, which was written, uh, I think, on every lamppost in uh, occupied Sevastopol. So Ivazovsky returned to the native harbor too. So all Ivazovsky works, which are in plentitude, were represented in the museums of Crimea, uh, were shipped to Moscow uh, to this exhibition in the Tretikov Gallery. Uh, Ukrainian officials protested, uh, sent uh, numerous letters to International Committee of Museums, but no reaction followed. Uh, the second clash uh, which happened after occupation of Crimea was connected um, with uh, exhibition of uh, Skissian gold, gold in Amsterdam in uh, Pearson's Museum. Uh, it received a lot of press and uh, a lot of misinterpretation. Uh, on the um, uh, screen, you can see the golden helmet, which was reproduced probably in all our articles in Western press on this issue. However, this uh, golden helmet had uh, nothing in common with Crimea. With Crimea. The exhibition uh, included two elements, a part of Skissian collection of the Kiev Museum of uh, Historical Treasures. Uh, on the cover of the catalog, you see another object, which is from Kiev. And variety of objects from Crimea, of course, not of such stunning quality. Uh, the exhibition was sent to Amsterdam before the um, uh, annexation of Crimea, but after the annexation, the Russian side demanded immediately to return all objects from Crimea to Crimea, to uh, literally saying to Russian Federation. Uh, it was a very long war, and during this war, some elements of uh, new usage of Skissia for ideological purposes uh, were clarified. Uh, in Russia now, there is a quite intensive line. I cannot say that it's historical, it's to the history. Uh, and it's a return to some 18th century standards. Uh, established by Catherine the Great, who believed that Skissian probably were predecessors of Russians. So now this uh, historic uh, uh, bric a brac was unearthed, and uh, Russians are claiming Skissia or Skissians as a part of their heritage, which is explaining uh, these fires battles, and which is explaining another very interesting element which was not noticed on time. Uh, Mr. Rogozin, a Russian politician, right-wing politician, uh, extremely close to Mr. Putin, uh, literally seven days before the war, appeared on Russian television reciting a poem by Alexander Bloch, Yes, we are Skissians. This pro poem, uh, written in 1918, was kind of warning to Europeans who uh, have to understand the power of the Scythian tribes. I think that the reciting of this poem was a clear sign that the war is coming. So uh, here on the uh, right side of the screen, you see Mr. Ragozin reciting this poem 
with a beautiful background of parade on the red square. And on the left side of the screen, you can see the collection of uh, Skisian artifacts, uh, which was in the local history museum in Melitopol. This collection uh, was the first Skisian uh, gold removed by Russian occupation of forces from Ukraine. The officials of the museum tried to hide it, but uh, one of them uh, proved to be collaborator uh, and betrayed his colleagues. So Russians confiscated these collections and removed it uh, to unknown destination. Until these days, we have no idea where it was moved. Uh, it's interesting that these removals happened uh, before Putin announced annexation of um, uh, uh, southern part of Ukraine. So it was not uh, even vaguely legalized from the Russian point of view. The same story happened in the uh, city of Mariupol, uh, which, as you know, was erased from the face of years, more or less. Uh, Mariupol had two museums, the Museum of Kuinji. Archip Kuinji was uh, very important 19th century artist of uh, Greek descent, because Mariupol is basically was a Greek city uh, populated by so-called North Black Sea Greeks. And this museum was opened already after the independence of Ukraine. Uh, it had small collection and the um, uh, peel of this collection was the uh, uh, first version of uh, Queen G painting the red sunset over the Dnieper. Uh, the museum was bombed and destroyed. Part of collection survived. And this painting was removed uh, proudly uh, by the Russian occupiers. And again, in that moment, Mariupol was not annexed to Russian Federation yet. So the reasoning was that it was removed for safety. However, who authorized Russian to do it, uh, it was never mentioned. There is an element of the story because uh, the museum had also the soil sketch of Ivazovsky, uh, which again returned to the native harbor. It was removed too. As we know, or again, it's uh, this uh, information is not verified. These artworks were um, uh, transported to Donetsk, which is not the safest place to keep them. Uh, and now we are coming to very interesting element, uh, which is again uh, requires very serious investigation, uh, rethinking, etc. Both. Uh, paintings, uh, Kuinji and Ivazovsky, were sent to Mariupol from the collection of the Tretikov Gallery in Moscow, which of course sells Kepin during the Soviet days. Uh, it's another specificity of uh, <coughs> uh, Russian colonial model. Russian paintings were sent to all museums in all republics of the former Soviet Union to create this cultural core of uh, Soviet culture. So 19th century Russian art was treated as a part of this core. On the left side of the slide, you can see another painting of Ivazovsky and painting of Rapin, uh, which traveled from the Tretikov Gallery as far as to the Republic of Tajikistan and were sent there quite late, in 1952. So this dispersing of Russian art around the Soviet Union was a part of established policy. In the same time, of course, it was not one-way street, because uh, main Russian museums were getting from the republics extremely important objects, uh, like uh, uh, on the right side of the slide, you can see mosaic of uh, Dmitry Sasunsky from uh, uh, Mikhailovsky Monastery in Kiev, Mikhailovsky Cathedral in Kiev, 
which was uh, detonated in the end of 1930s. So this, in 1937, this mosaic, which was removed, part of mosaics, portion of the, were removed before the detonation. Uh, and the monastery was detonated because instead of it, it was planned to construct um, uh, government quarters and gigantic statue of Lenin, uh, which um, uh, the project which never was complete. So this uh, mosaic in 1937 was sent to Moscow uh, as an exhibition loan for the exhibition dedicated to the uh, jubileum of the tale of the uh, Igor's army, but was never returned, despite all efforts of um, uh, Ukrainian museum curators, which continued until this war, because even during the 2000s, uh, Ukraine made uh, repeated claims for return of this mosaic. So from one hand, Russian art was spread around the country. From another hand, uh, other important scenes were taken from the republics to Moscow, which is creating a very complicated knot. And uh, at some moment in the future, it will be necessary to deal with it because uh, there are quite a lot of claims for internal restitution and it's not only Ukrainian claims. There are claims from Uzbekistan, uh, where archaeological materials were removed to Moscow, and from other republics. So here you will see what remained of another museum in Mariupol. It's a historical museum, which was destroyed by artillery fire. Those things which were uh, hidden in the cellar were removed by Russian occupiers. On the right side, you see quite unique photograph. It's the only photograph which I saw of a Russian officer removing actual artworks from the museum. Until this day, we don't know how the operation is organized. We don't know who is responsible for it. Is it army? Is it special forces? Do they have art experts? All of this is in darkness, and uh, we are getting all the rumors. So we don't have a clear understanding of what's going on. And here you can see what uh, did happen to the museum and those parts of its collection, which um, uh, it was impossible to remove to the cellar before Russian bombardment. Even more peculiar situation uh, happened in the city of Kherson. Of course, Kherson was the only regional center which was occupied by Russian forces. And uh, because of this, it was the only city with very important museums which fall into the Russian hands. Uh, Kherson has, uh, or I can say had, two major museums. It's the Art Museum of Shavkunenka, with quite broad collections, which included everything from, I don't know, Japanese prints and old masters to Ukrainian modernism, and uh, local history museum, which was extremely rich collection. The museum was established uh, way before the revolution, and uh, uh, initially was uh, founded as an archaeological museum. But later it grew, it had everything you can imagine from uh, uh, archaeology connected to the um, uh, Greek policies in the area, Skissi and Gold, and finishing extremely, with extremely important archives of the beginning of uh, 20th century, such as the part of archive of David Burluk, important Ukrainian and Russian futurist. So uh, before evacuation from Kherson, uh, Russians uh, started to do some strange things. Even before starting to evacuate museums, they uh, digged out remains of uh, Prince Potemkin from the grave in the um, uh, Kherson Cathedral. Uh, this uh, morbid uh, exercise, skin, uh, call in my mind only one issue. It's uh, uh, 
experiments of uh, Adolf Hitler with remains of Friedrich de Grosse and Bismarck, which were moved during the war all around Germany before they finally were not recovered in the end of the war by uh, Americans. Uh, in difference to the German experience, what Russians digged out from this grave uh, highly unlikely he had any connection to Prince Potemkin. Uh, this was the last chapter of, or maybe not the last chapter, of adventures of Potemkin remains because uh, his grave was first uh, destroyed during the um, uh, reign of Paul the First, who hated him. Uh, then it was reconstructed later. Then during the after the revolution, Potemkin remains were digged out and exhibited in the anti-religious museum in this cathedral. Then allegedly they were lost during the Second World War. Then some bonds were found. Was it Potemkin or not? Nobody knows. But uh, again, what we are facing here is the symbolical politics. Mr. Kinchen, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we do have to finish. So if you just... I, I'm finished, and it's the last okay. phrase, actually. So only thing which I want to show you what it happened to the collection of uh, Herson Museum. And finishing this, uh, I want to say that we still have to take an effort to understand how this model of uh, symbolical values, which is uh, so crucial today in the policies of Russian Federation was formed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, very impressive also, but um, we are running out of time very much and um, I'm afraid that our discussion must be very, very short. Um, I'm happy that the issue we, we are talking about now, the looting of art, is uh, referring to our next panel in a certain sense because the question of, uh, uh, of regaining it, uh, of, of uh, law aspects of looting, art looting, may be an issue in the next, in the next uh, panel. So if you have uh, short questions, very, very short questions, we can manage 10 minutes and we'll have a very short break afterwards. But I won't want to, to let uh, the speakers go without any discussion. So. Okay, thank you. Hello, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I would like to ask one question from uh, Alina Mozolewska. I know that uh, memes are a very popular grassroots genre. genre. Um, it's usually very hard to establish who is the author behind them. Uh, but in the context of war, they seem to be highly instrumentalized for uh, propaganda purposes. Uh, so in this context, I'm wondering uh, to what extent we can consider memes as uh, spontaneously emerging folklore uh, and to what extent uh, they can be considered as something uh, like a, a way of propaganda which is highly uh, centralized or can be in instru um, institutionalized. Uh, so, if you could say just a few words about it, I would be very grateful. Thank you. You should collect. Yes. For Mrs. Shavrova, uh, during your study visits in the neighboring countries of Ukraine, did you meet uh, Ukrainians, Ukrainians, refugees there, or? citizens of these countries to, to evidence your... Thank you. I could only come later, so I heard the 
a presentation about uh, the propaganda film development in Russia. And I would like to know, did you follow the debate about the Ukrainian filmmaker Lozinska, uh, who did films about the Maidan? And I saw them, and I saw why is he showing only violence. But uh, he is saying he would be on the side of the Ukraine. And here, in at least in Berlin, there was a very heavy debate on him, the Ukrainian cultural minister, a woman, um, deleted him from the board of the Art Academy, and I think the, the art community in Berlin is divided on the issue. So, thank you for the question, and Really, indeed, um, memes are now weaponized. It's a topic of our uh, conference. It's a really source of mobilization and propaganda, and there are um, uh, channels uh, that create the memes, memes in, with the aim, aim to support, for example, only one vision of the, the war. Um, I can name, for example, Z memes, a uh, public channel that creates memes to support pro-Kremlin uh, narratives. Uh, but, for example, in Ukraine we also have uh, so-called meme forces of Ukraine that also counter in, for example, some narratives and create um, s different visions of the war. Um, I think the degree of democratization and plurality of the views, it's the difference that w what difference, difference Ukrainian memes because they absorb uh, more uh, the variety of uh, symbols. They do not um, have problems with self-critique or uh, they can be also, um, they can laugh, to, uh, Ukrainians can laugh at themselves. But if we compare with the Russian examples, it's always centered on the other, uh, and there is no discussion about whether they are right or wrong. I think it's the most problematic issue here, um, this unanimity of uh, opinion uh, when we analyze Russian memes. Uh, so, but yes, you are right. It's a, it's a way to propagate the ideas, to create narratives. Thank you for the question. So it's, uh, it was a question about Leznitsa, uh, about director Leznitsa. <clears throat> uh, so my topic was about the f feature films, not about the dog, dog films. And as, so as I know, Leznitsa um, was directed by dog films. And the question was about the sources of fin financiation for, for his film. That was the problem. So um, uh, the question that was um, um, directed to me was uh, whether I have met um, Ukrainian refugee artists, presumably, uh, um, on my um, research trip to Lithuania. Um, I would say no, because uh, specifically I was looking at um, Lithuanian artists and their solidarity with Ukrainian artists. Um, and meeting uh, curators that worked with artists from Ukraine and Poland and other countries to contribute to this exhibition um, that um, I showed images from. However, as part of my work, I myself work with Ukrainian refugees and uh, next month, for example, there's a big project starting in Dublin, um, uh, supported by Business to Arts scheme with the Photo Museum Ireland where I will be working with a group of women uh, who have been um, in uh, Ireland for uh, some time, and we will be making a public art project that will uh, document the trajectory of their journey and hopefully also put their creativity and their words, um, but also the visual uh, worlds that they live in um, on th onto the public sphere. So. 
I hope that answers the question. And I think also I was asked to give the details of the exhibitions, the two Ukrainian exhibitions that are taking place in Berlin. Um, so one is actually in um, Bundestag, and this is um, the artist who I featured in the presentation, Evgeny Belarusets, and the project is called Next Door, or Poruch. Um, it is the Kiev War Diary that I featured, and it's uh, shown as an installation. And on the 21st of February, as long as you register, because obviously it's a government <coughs> building, there will be an important award ceremony that will be awarded to um, this artist who shares her time between Kiev and uh, Berlin. So that's the 23rd of February in Bundestag. And then the second exhibition, um, there is a, an event today at 7 p.m. and this is the talk by one of the artists that I featured, um, Nicola Ridney. Um, the exhibition is called Grapes of Wrath, uh, Attempt at Reapproachment, Ukraine, and it is um, in German, Frucht des Sons. Sorry, my German is non-existent. Um, and this is taking place in the Haus am Lutenplatz. So that's tonight at seven o'clock, and the exhibition continues for some days with some other public events also by Ukrainian artists, so you can <coughs> take a look at that. And if you're interested to follow the project that I mentioned with Ukrainian women, you can look on my website, which is vavarashavrova.com, and the material will be added to it as we start the project in March. Thank you very much. So I'm very sorry for the length of this panel due to technical, proble uh, technical problems. We have 10 minutes or 15 minutes for break for coffee? 15? 15 minutes. I'm sorry for the short discussion. You can, uh, you can of course, continue discussions here in in uh, the floors and uh, thank you very much to the speakers. I think it was very, very interesting. Thank you to Mr. Uh, thanks to Mr. Akincha for being online with us and uh, thanks a lot. Thank you for, thank you. Thank you for the time to moderation. I'm, uh,